Let me just get set up here. I mean, no, God is good. I'm on. Are you on? I'm live. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the Gospel according to John. This is where we're going to launch from today. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can turn it down just a little bit, Kim. Thirteenth chapter of the Gospel according to John. I want you to stay with me today. I got quite a few biz verses I want to read to you, but I will not. I will not be long today. I'm just going to present some things to you because we did a lot what we needed to do earlier. Amen. Thirteenth chapter of the Gospel of John. I need you to hear the word of the Lord today. Amen. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Y'all getting the picture? Everybody got it? All right. Rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Everybody got the picture? Okay. We all there? Just say amen, please. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, wow, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. That sounds like some of us, right? We, <laughs> we need it all. <laughs> Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to, uh, to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. That's real. Amen. So for a subject matter this morning, we're going to talk about two words. Everybody say, before dominion. A lot of us want to walk in a particular authority with something. Um, you want to be able to be given authority that you can do stuff, that you can have stuff. But in the kingdom of God, authority is given 
based on how your submission works. If you are in a place of submission, then it's easy to walk in authority. If you're not in submission, it's not easy to walk in authority. Amen? So the title speaks of where we're going. You want to have dominion over things. Before you can have dominion over things, you literally have to put some other things in order. Amen? So, Father, we come to you today and we thank you for your glory, for your power. We thank you for a resurrection grace. Uh, we thank you for that which you've designed for our personal lives. We ask that you open our hearts to receive the word of the Lord, that we might walk in your truth and walk in what you have given us. In Jesus' name, name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Please bear with me. I'm getting through this. <clears throat> so... For the most part, before you can walk in a place of dominion, there has to be healing in your spirit, and there has to be healing in your soul. I'm not going to be long today, so I want to get right to the matter. What does it mean to have healing in your spirit? A lot of times, we're wounded, and when we're wounded, it's very difficult for us to walk in a place of healing. We don't walk in healing simply because we have not received forgiveness in that area of our life, or we have rejected some things and rejected people, and we maintain the memory of what happened so that it takes us into a place. We will find blame in other places, and we will never blame ourselves, what they did to me. And, and, and instead of taking full responsibility for what has happened, God will not allow you to have dominion because the seed that is in you is a seed of unrighteousness. It is a seed of darkness. You have placed yourself in a position where you think you can reign over other people. And how I many you know God doesn't allow us to do that? So what God does is he restricts you and he places you uh, in boundaries where you cannot have dominion in certain areas of your life until you begin to move and operate according to the submitted plan that God has for your life. So in this passage that we just read, you saw Simon Peter. And when the Lord took off his robe, and began to wash Peter's feet. It was a very pivotal moment for Peter. Um, the Bible tells us that prior to this time, they had already went to the bathhouse. So the bathhouse is over here. And they all took showers, whatever that means back then. So they're coming out of the bathhouse. They're walking across the dirt. To the house that they were going to. So there's only one thing that's going to get dirty. What is it? Your feet. So Jesus used this analogy to begin to teach Peter some things. Um, and after he took everything, it says in verse 6, please. He came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Now, Peter was not the first one, but Peter was like... <laughs> You can wash their feet, but you don't need to wash my feet. Peter was known for the pride that was in his life. And he's different. I'm, I'm, I'm better than these guys. I, I don't need my feet washed. But Jesus made a statement. He said, what I am doing, you don't understand now. And I began to look at this, why he did not understand. And that was because what was seated in his life. What was seated in his life was his own pride. The pride that came out of his roots and out of his family. He, he was a well-known man. He was a businessman. And he had laid down laws already in his life. And he would not uproot those things. And it was Deacon Stephanie this morning even came forward. And she talked about there's some things you're going to have to break off from yesterday in order to get where you have to go. Everybody still there? So when Jesus made that statement, Peter was in an atmosphere to receive. 
Um, he says, but you will know after this. In other words, after I do this, some things are about to change in your life. The word of the Lord went on, and verse 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Take that to the bank. If you don't let God wash you, you don't have a part. No matter what gift you bring, that's his gift. But he's not going to let you throw that out there and call it your own. Sometimes we do things and God gets no credit for what we do. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, Michael Jordan, you went down there, you done spin three times, you done took it behind your back twice, you done threw it up into the, to, to the backboard, you done snatched it off the backboard, you done turned around, and you done literally, sweetly dropped it into the bucket. And the crowd goes wild. And you say it's been your training and how you designed. That glory doesn't belong to you. Because that which you have, Mr. Jordan, I'm just using him as an example. That which you have is God-given. Y'all with me today? So perhaps there are some of us, there are things that you do, ways that you do things, and you're good. I mean, you're good, good. Nobody even notices that you're good. They notice you way out. And they see, and they're like, yeah, they're really good. But God's not going to let you go anywhere. Simply because he doesn't get any glory out of what you do. You there? And some of us, we want lights. And we're not happy with being where he wants us. Well, not everybody needs lights. Some people need to be in the trenches. Amen. Amen. You need to be able to be there. You know, ah, oh, I didn't get to grow up. I had kids early. I'm going to have my time now. And your kids are still under the age of 10. Oh, no, you're a mama. You're a dad. You don't get that option. You got to pour back. In fact, if you conceive it, you got to birth it, and you got to raise it. Hello? You don't, you don't get that privilege. We have to learn to give back. So God began to use this scripture to begin to call Peter into a place, bro. I need you to be changed. I need you to change how you see some things. And I need you to humble yourself. Authority is positional. In other words, I can only give you authority based on how you position yourself and how you allow me to position you. Some of you here are the oldest in your family. As the oldest, you had responsibility growing up. There are some you wouldn't be given responsibility simply because you did not appear that you wanted to carry things out. So mom and dad didn't trust you. And you became hurt behind that. But you did not put forward what you needed to put forward so that the blessings of the Lord would be on your life. Are you there today? Healing has to come to your spirit first. In other words, your heart has to be in the right place. So every day, God comes to you and he starts tapping on your heart. Hey, I need you to change that. And then still small voice, he says, I need you to work on that. Why are you screaming at them? Why are you so mean? Stop it. Don't do that. Be gentle. So God start tugging on your heart. And you don't see people changing you, but he's letting you set yourself up for a fall. Amen. So God begins to work you and put you into the place where you have to literally humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so that he can exalt you in due time. It's not going to happen any other way. I'm going to give you a scenario of a friend, and I'm going to close with this today because 
This is consecration week. It's a time where we get to humble ourselves. God, clean me. Show me where I was wrong. Um, sometimes we think we got to go to people, we got to tell them. You need to go to God first. Go to God first. And that's where we start. Forgiveness is a huge piece of walking in humility. You have to be able to forgive everyone, and you have to also be able to be forgiven. Well, you know, I did this wrong, I did that wrong. It's okay. Get over it. Did I say that? All right. I don't need to say it again, right? Tell your neighbor what I said. <laughs> you messed up. You messed up. It was bad. And I'm also speaking to whoever you are out there that had an abortion. Get over it. You'll never stop the plan of God. Get over it. God needs us to move into a new place. I'm not saying squash it. I'm saying you need to come into your humility and know that it's not you that keeps you running. It's God. When we walk in a place of unforgiveness like that, even for ourselves, that's all part of pride. That's why God can't release blessings because it's the wrong spirit that's at the top. It's a spirit of pride. So God had this friend. And in the Bible, it says he was a friend of God. But even though he was a friend of God, God kept working on his heart. Because things weren't working right. Y'all know who I'm talking about. I'll tell you who I'm talking about in a minute. But this friend, he said, bro. Can I just paraphrase? He said, bro, I really want to be a blessing to you, and I want you to be a blessing. But I need you to gather your family up, okay? Leave your father's house. Leave the family around you. Leave your work, and come and go with me. I got a place I want to show you that I'm preparing for you. Bro partially listened. He took his dad with him. You know, now one of us would have said, didn't I tell you to leave your dad at home? Why? Because he knew how to walk in submission, but he wasn't understanding how to walk in submission with God. So dad was still running the show. And God would not allow him to enter into the promises until dad died. Once dad died, you allowed him to enter into promises. Some of you still walk under the submission of the rules of your bloodline. Until you let that go, it's not going to happen. Okay? You got to walk with God. And if you need counsel, we have many people that can bring counsel to you to say, you know, that's something you need to let go of. There are some people that will never grow in the grace of God because they stay in the traditions of church life that came out of their family. Your great-great-grandfather built this church. You're going to be in this church. Church is dying. They only got five people in it. You're still going to be there. We're going to keep it going. You know, pastor's got to do the sermon, play the organ, <laughs> greet at the door. I mean, it, it. Shandala Botonte Shike. I'm coming against that spirit. <laughs> But you have to get to the place where you're going to follow the will of God. And you're going to walk in true grace. Amen? Amen? So he got up and he left. After his dad died, the Lord said, I want you to go down to Egypt. Now, that didn't even make sense. But it makes sense if you know that God's going to set you in a world system so that I can teach you to trust me. A lot of people want to be preachers and all that kind of stuff. Stop it. You already are a preacher. Just go out and do what God has told you to do. You don't stop running your mouth with church language and speak the real language. Hey, how you doing? Love you. Good to see you today. Good morning. Not God morning. Good morning. Well, you know, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, man, that's religion all over again. 
How many of you go to church and go to, go to work and say, praise the Lord, everyone, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, they found Jesus. <laughs> and then the minute something happens, your spirit is already wounded. Now you, you need healing in your emotions, and you say the wrong things. And you get angry. And then tell everybody, you know, yeah, I'm a churchgoer. My kids are being baptized. Oh, we're going through confirmation, all that kind of stuff. So like, Mm-mm. You're not changed. You're religious. But even religion can be an idol before the Lord. So Abraham, that's my buddy. That's God's buddy. Abraham goes down to Egypt because God, God had to test him again. He goes down. Pharaoh comes before him because, you know, Pharaoh can have anybody that walks in his town. And he's got a whole harem of people, women, okay? And he saw Sarah. He said, Abraham, who, who is that? He said, that's my sister. Oh, okay. So he took her into his harem. Abraham's like, you know, well, he, he didn't kill me. What was the whole thing? Abraham did not want to die. What did God do behind that? God sent a dream down to Pharaoh's heart. <laughs> Pharaoh said, y'all better get that brother Abraham. Get, get him back in here. What is you trying to do to me? What is, look, look, I just had this dream. This is not your sister. Who is he? That's my wife. What? Look, I want you, because I'm about to die. I want you to get your folks, get all your people, get out of my town. Leave now. I want you gone now. Oh, and then he looked at his butlers and all the people, and he said, give them this. Give them that. Give them, give them every, anything he wants. Give him 100 cow. Give him give whatever he needs. Give it to him. Get him, get him. get him out here. How many know God can do that? Man, how could you dare sit there and lie to me? So Abraham flunked the test again. He kept flunking all these tests. But he was a friend of God. And we get to this particular place in the scriptures. Before this place came, God told him, he said, you're going to have enough kids to multiply the seed. He ain't had no kids yet, and he's looking around, and he's 90 years old yet, and he ain't had no kids. All right, actually, he was 87. Was it? I can't remember. 91, that's what it was. He's 91 when he had his first kid. All right, so here, God told me you're going to have kids. He ain't had no kids. Now, I've been on this journey with you guys since I was 75. I'm 91 now. Ain't no kids coming along, and Sarah, she passed the time, man. She... I don't know anybody who's had kids that late. So what, what are we doing here? And he's, God comes and he said, listen, I'm going to change your name because now your name is going to mean father of many nations. Okay, so I'm prophetically going to speak over to your life, but I need you to begin to walk with me on this one. Okay, so Sarah comes, honey, I don't know about you, but I don't think this thing is happening. So why don't you take Hagar and have a kid and she can sit on my knees and birth the child, and it'll be like it's coming from me. That's what they did back then. So he's like, fine. <laughs> <laughs> you selfish young man, you. <laughs> he wasn't there yet. He wasn't there. So he had the kid. And y'all know Ishmael. And many of us have Ishmaels in our life. We've literally produced something that was fleshly. We're holding on to it. So God got to a particular place, and Sarah came along, and she says, hey, your son is now four, and Ishmael, 13, he's picking on him. You need to get rid of that woman. Okay, so Abraham, being the man he is, he came and he said, okay, let's soften this. You guys got to work with Sarah. You got to stop picking on uh, Isaac. Leave him alone. This is your brother. You know, Ishmael don't have it in him because he's a child of the flesh. Abraham did it his way. He don't have it in him to be nice. Are y'all there? Some things you just got to know. So Sarah's like, you need to get rid of her. So God came to Abraham again. And I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase. God said it like this. Abraham, you need to listen to your wife. Get rid of her. So he got some food and stuff together, and he sent her out. 
So and that's how Islam got created under, by those people. So <clears throat> now we're back. Abraham, Isaac, and Sarah. Everybody there? We're back. Abraham's not ready yet. So this is what God says. Genesis 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things, what I just told you, that God tested Abraham again and said to him, Abraham. In other words, God came to him and he's like, Abraham. Y'all know when your mama call you or something, you call you by your name. Hey! <laughs> hey, so-and-so. <laughs> so he's got something to say. And he said, here am I. All right. That sounds like a really happy mood, right? Right. Here am I. I'm coming. You know, something of that nature. All right. Then he said, verse 2, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. I love God. He says, I want you to take your son, you know, the one that you love more than me. This is what he's saying. You know, the son I gave you that you love more than me. I want you to take him to, uh, to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God waited till his heart was tender. And he was so loving. And he said, boop, surprise. Abraham, I'm not doing this so that I know. I'm doing this so that you will know that I want you to be so dear to me that you walk like me. Because guess what? I'm about to offer up my son. And I need you to be able to see that. Are y'all there? So y'all know the story. He went up to the mountain, and Isaac's 33 years old. He puts him up on the altar, and he's like, okay, Dad, what's going on? I need you to trust me, son. All right? Now, y'all know, y'all know. So you figure he had him when he was 91. He's 33. So that makes him 120-something years old, right? So, <clears throat> by the way, he wasn't an old 120. He was still young and vibrant. Okay? So he told his son, he said, lay down. What did the son do? At 33 years old, he laid down on the altar. He tied him down on the altar. Dad, what's going on? He took the knife and he raised it and began to come down when the Lord said, Abraham. I was waiting on that. <laughs> said, don't do it. And then behind him, there was a ram in the bush. He said, I provided an offering for you. But the Lord took him down off the mountain. He said, now I know that you love me more than you love your own life. That you would sacrifice that which I have given to you. All right, is everybody there today? The scripture says out of Hebrews chapter 11, uh, I believe it's either 19 or 22. I don't have it written down. But it says that the night before... Abraham had a dream, and he literally saw the death of Isaac. But he saw Isaac being raised from the dead. It wasn't Isaac. Who was it? Y'all got it. Now, for all of us who are in this space, every single one of us, what do you have to put on the altar? Every single one of us got something we got to put on the altar. Maybe it's something that you have to be right about. And maybe you are right. But maybe you just need to lay it down. What are you putting on the altar? God didn't put Isaac on the altar. Abraham put Isaac on the altar. So before dominion can come, 
before the Lord can say, I know, you got to put something on the altar. Maybe it's the fact that your money is greater than your God. I don't need to tithe. I don't need to give. When he said give it, and then we try to find justified ways. People call me with justification for not tithing and giving. And you know what the conversation always goes like this. Here's the final analysis. Listen, if your faith is not there, don't do it. That's not God's plan. But your faith not there, don't do it. You will live where you are. I won't tell them that. Okay, but that's the decision you make. But when you learn to put things on the altar, I mean, no, God will begin to give you dominion in things. Some of us will get sickness in our lives, and you know what? You won't get past that, oh, I got a headache, I won't go to church. Oh, I got a headache, I won't go to church. 20 years from now, oh, I got a headache, I'm not going to church. Instead of saying, I bind that thing now in the name of Jesus. You know, I'm going out because I need to worship and praise him. Uh, I'll get there when I get there. Time delayed is blessings delayed. What do you have to put on the altar? This is the week of consecration. What are we putting on the altar? Maybe you got an attitude with somebody about something. Maybe we need to put that on the altar. What is it? Maybe you haven't gotten over the death of somebody. Why don't you put it on the altar? I'm in pain. So-and-so took my mom. So-and-so took my dad. Stop it. Stop it. I have something to boast when it comes to that. No. I'm not going to live in my past. I'm putting my past on the altar. Are you there? you got to come into the prosperity of where you are now and of your destiny. That's true prosperity. Put it on the altar. Oh, I got this. I'm too old for that. You're never too old. How old is old? Ask Abraham. 100 years old, he having a kid. 75 years old, his wife was, she having a kid. What would y'all have said? Oh, my goodness, I'm 75. How do I do this? I'm, having, I'm, I'm going to die in childbirth. Y'all would have had all that going on. <laughs> this is my first one. No, no. Oh, God. What do we do? Do we see this thing? See section this thing? How are we going to do this? Get over it. Let God be true and every man a, a liar. Oh, let me go another place. I'm not going to college. I can't afford college. I can't afford. What do you mean go to college? My family can't afford college. My mother made $11,000 a year. My college bill was $11,000 a year. And you're going to tell me I wasn't going to college? I was going to college. That was back then. I went because it was my destiny. Now, it may not be your destiny. But how dare we say we can't do something because we live in a world system that tells us we can't do it. You can do anything you want to do when you walk in the plan of God. Are y'all with me today? It's important that you understand, but you got to lay that stuff on the altar. What are you putting on the altar? What are you giving up? What are you laying down? Once you put it on the altar, behind that comes a wealth of dominion. But God doesn't share his throne with no one. So when you walk in that dominion, it has to be the truth that he's called you to. Amen. Come on, TV. Hallelujah. Ha. Glory to God. We got this. On the altar. So this week, when you see people snap out, just ask them. Do we need to pray and put that on the altar? I can't do this because. I can't do that because. Is that something we need to put on the altar?
because in order for you to get the dominion you need, you got to put it on the altar. Amen. Hallelujah. Worship you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you. Humbly I stand and offering. Everybody, let's sing this together. Come on. Let's just make this a worship right now. A decree. Humbly I stand and free. Yes, Lord. With open hands, Lord, I bring. Everybody. Everything and nothing less. My best, my all. You deserve it, Jesus. You deserve my every breath. My life, my song. I I surrender, I surrender all. Lord, take control. Lord, take control. Come on, stay here with us. Come on. I trust you. And I'm letting go of you. I'm letting go to give you, yes, Lord, everything and nothing less, my best, my all, you deserve, you deserve my every breath, my life. My song. My surrender. Come on, everybody, let's decree it. I surrender. I surrender all. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender all. Oh 
There's somebody here today, perhaps you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is an opportunity for you to come.